The greatest challenge that businesses all over the world are facing right now is not to achieve success. We all know of people, individuals, groups, and organizations who have achieved amazing success just since the turn of the century back in 2000. However, many, many times these people have achieved incredible results only to fall way, way back down. The greatest challenge that businesses all over the world are facing right now is not to achieve success. The greatest challenge is to sustain success over the long term. And that's what I want to focus on this morning with a particular emphasis on innovation and leadership. For our 10th wedding anniversary, my wife Barb and I wanted to do something really, really different. We wanted to get away from our kids. No, I mean that in a positive way. We positively wanted to get away from our kids. So three months before our 10th wedding anniversary, I came downstairs to the kitchen one morning, and Barb is sitting at the kitchen table, and she's flipping through one of those glossy vacation catalogs, and she says to me, Dan, sit here. Look at this magazine. Which one of these two pictures do you like better? I said, well, um, I, uh, I, uh, I like this one better. She said, okay. Three months later, I woke up. I was standing under a thatched roof with water up to my waist at a swim-up bar in Mexico, drinking a foo-foo drink and watching Barb do water aerobics. And I thought to myself, this is paradise. For the next five days, I am not going to read any books. I am not going to write any books. I am not looking for any ideas on how to accelerate results. I am just going to stand right here at this swim-up bar and drink my foo-foo drinks. And then it happened. I noticed that Barb was doing water aerobics. Now, my wife likes to walk. She likes to play tennis. But she hates aerobics. And yet there she was pumping her arms and pumping her legs with about 15 other women, and I could not figure out what was going on. And then I looked a little farther over, and then I saw him. <laughs> Tall, dark, and handsome. His name was Caesar. And Caesar was the instructor of the aerobics class. And whatever Caesar did, these 15 women did. The next day, we were playing water volleyball with a bunch of little kids, some young adults, some older adults. And we're having a great time. And I look over, and with a whistle around his neck, the coach is Caesar. The next night, we're at the hotel restaurant. And after dinner, everybody was up and dancing with their partners. We were having a great time. And I look up. And dressed in a tuxedo up on the platform, the MC is Caesar. And it finally dawned on me what was happening. The reason we were all having so much fun is because he was having so much fun. The next day, after, um, after Barb got her picture taken with Caesar, <laughs> I interviewed him. And I said, Caesar, how many years have you been working at this resort? He said, two years. I said, how many weeks vacation do you get every year? He said, two weeks. I said, how many days a week do you work here? He said, five days. So that means by the time that Barb and I got to Mexico, Cesar had already been on the job 500 days. But he had the enthusiasm of somebody who was on the job for the very first time. So I said to him, Cesar, how do you maintain your enthusiasm every day? He said, well, when people come down here, they really want to have a good time. And it's my goal to do my very best to make sure that happens. And then it dawned on me. This is another key to accelerating business results. We have to have the same level of enthusiasm on day number 500 and year number 5 and year number 25 that we had on day 1. I'm a big fan of Dale Carnegie. I've read the Dale Carnegie books. I have listened to the Dale Carnegie tapes. I have taken the Dale Carnegie courses. I really like Dale Carnegie. There's one thing that Dale Carnegie said that I really, really disagree with. Dale Carnegie said, to be enthusiastic, act enthusiastic. I really disagree with that. 
I think if we go around acting enthusiastic when we're really not, we're going to come across as a fake. We're going to come across as not being genuine. So here is a two-step process for maintaining daily enthusiasm. Step one is identify why you do what you do for a living. What is your purpose besides the paycheck? Every person in this room right now could be doing a hundred other jobs. Why is it that you do what you do? Remember that passion comes from purpose, not the other way around. What I'm encouraging you folks to do is to be passionate about achieving results, but stay logical in analyzing results. What I'm talking about right here happens inside businesses as well. Steve was a results-driven executive. And the reason I know Steve was a results-driven executive is because the very first time I met him, he said to me, Dan, I am a results-driven executive. And I said, well, that's good, Steve, because the job of an executive is to improve results in a sustainable way. Steve then told me four more times in the next 45 minutes that he was a results-driven executive. So I finally said to him, I said, Steve, what do you mean by a results-driven executive? He said, well, at the beginning of every quarter, we set a goal. And at the end of the quarter, if we achieve or exceed the goal, then we have a celebration. And if we don't achieve the goal, then I lay people off to get the point across that we have to achieve our goal. I said, Steve, how much money are you leaving on the table using that approach? He said, I'm not leaving any money on the table. What are you talking about? I said, well, how much time and energy are your employees wasting, worrying, and being anxious about achieving the results that they could actually be using to improve the results? Steve said, he said, I, I've heard it's pretty nerve-wracking to work for me, but hey, that's business. I said, Steve, you're only answering two questions. There's five more questions to answer. He said, what are you talking about? I said, all you're answering is, what was the goal and what did we achieve? But there's five more questions. What was the goal? What did we achieve? What did we do to try to achieve the goal? What worked well and why did it work well? What did not work well and why did it not work well? What lessons have we learned or relearned? And what are we going to do the same and what are we going to do differently going forward? Steve looked at me and he said, Dan, I don't want to run my business looking in the rearview mirror all the time. I said, Steve, I don't want you to either. But if you, all you do is answer those first two questions, then all you're going to do is the same thing that you've always done. When I was in college, I was the third string, non-scholarship, walk-on goalie all four years. Which means when I was a freshman, there were two guys ahead of me. And when I was a senior, there were two guys ahead of me. And it was a different set of two guys. My position on the team was the fourth seat over from the right end of the bench. By my sophomore year, if a freshman sat there, the other players would say, no, no, no. That's where Coughlin sits. The only time I ever even got into a game, we were either up by five goals or we were down by five goals, and there'd be 10 minutes left in the game, and the coach would yell out, Coglin, come here. So I'd run over to my coach, I'd grab my goalie gloves, and I'd be ready, and he'd go, I want you to go in there, and I want you to make a difference. So I'm running on the field, and I'm thinking to myself, there are 10 minutes left in the game, we're down by five goals, and I'm the goalie. I'm not really sure how I'm going to make a difference. At the end of my four years in college, my coach, Dennis Gray, said to me, Dan, what do you want to do for a living? My degree was in mechanical engineering, so I said to him, I want to do what you do. I want to be a college coach. He said, well, as a matter of fact, there's a small university 90 miles away. They're starting up a brand new program. Would you like to try to get an interview? I said, I'd love to get an interview. I got the interview and I got the job. Then he said to me, would you like to work at the Indiana University soccer camp? Indiana University, back in those days, had four weeks of camp, 600 kids, high school and grade school kids from all over the country would come to Bloomington, Indiana for soccer camp. I said, I would love to work at the IU soccer camp. He got me the interview and I got the job. I showed up the first day on the job. Here is the coaching staff for these grade school and high school kids. Professional soccer players who played in the World Cup. College head soccer coaches who were in the Hall of Fame. High school 
head soccer coaches who were in the Hall of Fame, current college soccer players who were All-American, and me, I sat fourth seat from the right, barely ever even got into a game. So I said to the coach, I called up my coach, and I said, Coach Grace, how in the world am I going to be able to coach with all these famous people? And he gave me the single best piece of leadership advice that I have ever received. He said to me, Dan, just let Dan be Dan. If you try to act like a big shot, if you try to act like somebody you're not, it's going to be a failure. Just let you be you, and everything will work out great. And that's the same advice that I have for everybody here. Just let you be you with your strengths and your passions and your values, and you will be terrific as a leader. Don't try to be somebody that you're not. Tom was the vice president of operations of about a $500 million business unit. I was working with Tom as an executive coach. Tom and I got along very, very well. One day he said to me, Dan, I have a problem. I said, Tom, what is it? He said, my boss thinks that I'm not very strategic. He thinks I'm not very creative. I said, it's okay, Tom. I have seen this situation many, many times in the past. Here is what I suggest you do. Tom picked up a pen. He said, this is going to be important. I'm going to want to write this down. I said, Tom, here's what I suggest you do. On your weekly calendar, I suggest that you block out one hour a week to think. One hour a week where you get away from your boss and your customers and your, your employees and your suppliers and your family and your dog and you go somewhere where no one knows you. You take out a blank sheet of paper and at the top of the sheet of paper you write down one business outcome that you want to improve or one issue that you want to resolve. Take that outcome or that issue and turn it into an open-ended question. Not a yes or no question, but, a, but an open-ended question. Take 35 minutes and answer that question from a variety of perspectives. Your perspective, your boss's perspective, your employee's perspective, your customer's perspective, your competitor's perspective. Come up with as many ideas as you can for 35 minutes. At the end of 35 minutes, take the next 10 minutes, look at all of your ideas, combine ideas together to make even better ideas. At the end of 45 minutes, take your best idea, put together an action plan over the next 15 minutes, and then go back into your regular work week. I said, I think if you will do that, you can have a tremendous impact on all the other hours in your work week. Tom looked at me, he put his pen down, and he said to me, Dan, that is the dumbest idea that I have ever heard. <laughs> he said, if I go off to La La Land to think, people are gonna make fun of me. He said, you don't understand. People don't pay me to sit around and think. People pay me to get things done. I said, Tom, I do understand. People don't pay you to get things done. People pay you to improve results. If you'll take one hour a week to really think, I think you can have a tremendous impact on your results. He said, fine, I'll try it. Three weeks went by and I saw Tom again. I said, Tom, how's it going? He said, well, I just want to let you know I tried your thinking idea. I said, yeah, how did it go? He said, I just want to let you know I wasted three hours that I could have been getting a lot of stuff done. I said, Tom, hang in there. Two more months went by, and we were talking about this again, and he said to me, Dan, I just want to let you know I came across an idea that we've never tried before in operations, but I'm thinking about maybe doing it. What do you think? I said, do you think it might have a positive impact on your most important business outcomes? He said, it might. I said, do you think it's going to have a high risk? Is it going to have a very negative impact on those outcomes? He goes, I don't think it's going to. I said, try it. About four more months went by, and we were talking about this again, and he said, Dan, I just want to let you know I now schedule an hour a week to think, and everybody on my team schedules an hour a week to think. He said, I just have one problem with you. I said, what is it? He said, why didn't you tell me to do this when we first met? <laughs> I did not have a very good answer, so I don't want to make that mistake twice. I encourage you folks, everybody in this room, regardless of the size of your organization or your title within the company or the organization, I encourage you to schedule on your calendar one hour a week to think. One hour a week where you get away from your boss, your employees, your suppliers, your customers, your family and your dog, and you go somewhere where nobody knows you. Take out a blank sheet of paper. At the top of the sheet of paper, write down one outcome you want to improve or one issue you want to resolve. Turn it into an open-ended question. For 35 minutes, write down as many ideas as you can from a variety of perspectives. For the next 10 minutes, combine ideas together to make an even better idea. At the end of 45 minutes, choose your best idea, 
take 15 minutes to put together an action plan and move back into action. I think if you will do that, you can have a terrific impact on your results. The most important step in business, in my opinion, is to step back and really think.